Hey folks, hey viewers, Steve here with another Fatal Alliances video. Um, if you didn't see my last video, Fatal Alliances The Great War is a World War I hex encounter grand strategy game published by Compass Games, designed by Andrew Rader, or might be Ratter, I'm really not sure, uh, based on the uh, well known World in Flames system, which normally covers World War II. Uh, and I, my last video was sort of an overview of the game, and I thought it would be good uh, to do a video, do uh, essentially a, an overview of the land units in the game, because this game system includes a number of different types of units that can be built and utilized in the game. And uh, unfortunately, the, the rule book doesn't necessarily give you a really great breakdown in comparison between these unit types. Uh, and so I've kind of put together um, some example counters, and I'll talk through each one and give you kind of uh, the basic functions of the units, how they might be used in a real game. Uh, and then, you know, when you actually get a chance to play the game yourself, you'll have a little bit more knowledge on wh what is it that I'm looking at in this huge mess of counters uh, in front of me. So, uh, I I'll probably do another video uh, about air units and uh, sea units after this. We'll see how well this goes. Um, and I'll keep trying to make videos for this game as I can think of good topics to cover. Uh, like examples of mechanics and, and, and different things uh, as I go. So um, if you've watched this and you you're, you want to see something in particular, uh, let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can do. Uh, so we'll just get right into it. Uh, like I said, I, I've, I've grabbed a few counters of each type in the game, um, and there's a fair number of them. And uh, one thing to keep in mind is that units are separated into, um, we'll say, their core and higher sized units. And if you're not familiar with symbol notation, uh, the symbol notation of NATO, uh, a core is going to be three X's. So in this, uh, I think almost all of the ones here in this first column are going to have the three X's. That means they are core. Uh, four X's is an army, five X's is an army group, um, and I think you can go up to theater level, but most war games don't include counters for that type of thing. Um, any counter you see that is going to be three X's or above are all treated the same in terms of stacking, and you can have up to two per hex, and then the third unit that can be in a stack is a division, and a division is the two X units, so uh, some unit types have both core and division versions and others may just be divisions or may just be cores so just keep an eye on the counters that you're looking at and and you'll be able to tell the difference pretty easily um, you know for example the the very first set of counters I have here are just basic infantry units uh, the division with the two X's is obviously much weaker than the core the core having a combat factor the first number uh, a four, uh, movement three, and then the division is combat factor one, just one, and movement of three. Movement about the same because they're the same type of unit, uh, but the core obviously being a big, bigger set of m fighting men. Um, so keep that in mind as you go through here, and um, I'll try to give some recommendations on division use and when's a good time to put divisions in. You may not always have a hex with three units in it, um, but it can be useful to have a good solid line packed to the brim with as many combat factors as, as you can afford to put in there. A um, couple of quick notes. Just This is stuff that are in the rules and the combat charts. Uh, you, there are units with white print instead of a, a dark colored numbers uh, on here you might find some that have white text like uh, this French headquarters unit um, that means that their combat factors aren't reduced uh, if they are uh, disordered and out of supply um, I think and then uh, there are certain types of uh, we'll say qualities that units can have so Japanese white print units Australian white print units and US Marine white print units 
uh, are considered jungle fighters, so they uh, can fight without negatives. They can fight better in jungle terrain. And then all mountain units, uh, all Swedish units, all Finnish units, all Norwegian units, and all white print Russians are considered winterized, which means they can avoid some of the penalties for being in snowy weather, blizzard weather, that, sign, that kind of thing. Um, and it can be easy to forget that when you're playing the game. So those are just a couple of things to keep in mind uh, when you're forming your strategies and playing the game. So besides that, uh, a regular infantry corps and division, like we have here, the top two counters. Um, I'll zoom in a little bit more just so we can get a good look at them. Um, these are your basic units, right? World War One, very infantry oriented. You will have more infantry like this on the board than probably any other unit, and you're going to be building them quite a bit because you need them to hold the line. They're they're just all around your basic unit. They're typically going to have combat factors between I'd say three and six for the cores, um, and maybe one or two for the divisions, and the movement points may vary from two to three. Uh, so you know, nothing too fancy. Um, you're probably going to use the divisions uh, for force ratio tipping. And when I say force ratio tipping, what I mean is when you have hexes that you have units in and you're attacking another hex, um, just having two of your core-sized units in a hex attacking maybe doesn't give you the full, you know, 3 to 1 or 4 to 1 or 5 to 1, 6 to 1 ratio that you want for good combat odds. So if you throw in a division in there, it might just give you uh, the numbers that you need for the force ratio that you want. Um, so, you know, you, you're really what you're going to do is as you get the divisions, as you build them um, or get them out there on the field, they're, they're just going to fill in holes, improve your hexes that may have two units in them, or maybe, you know, back up a, a hex where you have one core um, and you just want to put something else with it to make it a little bit beefier, you, you throw in a division. Um, really nothing special. They, they're going to do the bulk of the fighting uh, until some of the other units come into the play later in the, the war. Um, but even then, you're, you're really looking at new divisions more than new cores. So um, it's always going to kind of rely on these guys. Uh, the later war infantry that come in, the counters tend to be more in the higher numbers, like 5 and 6. Um, so at some point you may consider scrapping units out of your force pool to get rid of threes and fours. Um, and that's really it. Uh, next up are the cavalry corps and division. Um, if you're not familiar with NATO symbols, um, you know, infantry is, a, is an X. Um, sometimes you know, supposedly representing either two crossed swords or two crossed rifles. Um, and the slash for cavalry maybe just means a cavalry saber. I'm not really sure what the, the reasoning behind that is, but these are your cavalry. Don't be confused. Um, and there's some special things to keep in mind about these units. Now, you won't have them in huge, huge numbers like you do infantry, but you do get an okay number of them, usually for any country. Uh, they are going to be your first early mobile unit. And when I say mobile, um, I mean that in kind of two ways. One, their movement speed is higher than infantry. So they have five movement points. They can cover a lot more ground in a single move. Um, their combat factors are roughly the same, or you know, you're going to find that they're not especially more powerful than infantry or anything like that, and maybe in some cases generally weaker than some of your infantry. Uh, but what's special about them is that after a combat has taken place, assuming they haven't been flipped due to the combat results, you know, when you advance units, uh, typically they will flip. So, um, just as an example, we'll say these units are in combat, this German infantry manages to push Kitchener uh, back, or maybe he destroys Kitchener, you know, he's removed from the game. Uh, to be rebuilt, and this unit can now advance, but if he does, as an infantry, he's going to flip. And that's going to mean he's going to be susceptible to being counterattacked uh, if he's not careful. Now, what cavalry can do, and what I'll, I'll, I'll dub them as mobile units can do, 
is that if the same combat occurred and that combat involved a cavalry, the cavalry could fight the battle, defeat Kitchener, yeah, he's kicked out. And when it comes to advancing after combat, the cavalry can advance without flipping. Again, assuming they didn't get, you know, you, you didn't get a, a bad result or a yellow result on the combat chart where the attacking units have to flip. Assuming that you can avoid that, uh, the cavalry can move forward. And that's important because if you can keep that going, um, you're less likely to be hurt by counterattacks with disrupted units. You, you keep things orderly. Um, and for that reason, I would recommend that cavalry divisions just be grouped with other cavalry. Um, having a cavalry division with an infantry corps, yeah, you can do it. Um, but when it comes time to advancing after combat, um, maybe this unit can come and it can flip, and this unit will come unflipped. Uh, but I think it makes sense to concentrate your valuable units like that. So if you've got a really great, uh, we'll say, formation of two cavalry units in a cavalry division, they can hit hard, advance, you know, attack again, advance, um, and cover a good a bit of ground, of ground, assuming you've got the maneuvering room to do it with, which, depending on what theater and what you're doing, you, maybe you don't have that. Um, but that would be my recommendation until other units come into play later in the game. These will always be a little bit useful for that re reason, making sure you can get into a critical um, area without flipping and thus being able to defend it, defend it better. Uh, next up are the Mountain Corps in Division. These are the first um, units you'll probably come into play that are terrain-enabled. Um, and they're kind of rare. You'll find that your force pool is not going to include very many of these. You might have a handful at most, maybe a couple. Um, and what's really special about them is that uh, they're, they're typically pretty strong. So, you know, four combat pack, uh, factors is about the norm. So that's decently okay. They also have a pretty good movement. So this example, uh, Alpen Corps. Uh, has four movement. That's a little bit better than your average regular infantry, um, which allows these mountain units to actually traverse mountain hexes, which cost more to move into, so they can, can traverse that a little bit better. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned before, these units are always going to be winterized, so they're good in uh, the winter. Uh, they also have double garrison value, which is a mechanic in the game that has um, various uses and in some ways you just sort of look at this as these guys are really good at maintaining their position. Um, they can cross alpine hex sides which normal units can't do that and um, I should be able to find some alpine hex sides. It's these connections between hexes that have this white uh, border sort of like a white mountain peak kind of thing you could almost think of it as. That's an alpine hex side and most units can't attack across an alpine hex side, uh, but a mountain unit can attack uh, across an alpine hex side and can cross an alpine hex side. If they move across an alpine hex side, it's going to cost them one extra movement point, and when they attack across an alpine hex side, they're going to have their combat factors. So instead of being four, it'll be a two. Um, how much you'll make use of that ability will depend. Uh, you may use that more in the actual Alps between, you know, Italy and Germany and Austria potentially. Um, but it's it's a nice to have if you need it. The other really important thing about these mountain units is that a mountain unit defending in mountain terrain triples its combat factors as opposed to the normal doubling. So an infantry in a hex, a mountain hex will defend as eight combat factors instead of four, and you say, hey, that's pretty good. Uh, but the Alpen Mountain Corps here is going to defend at 12, which is quite a bit better, um, quite a bit better. And, of course, that may mean that if you're going to have your mountain division with your Mountain Corps, you could be looking at combat factor 15, which is a tough nut to crack no matter how you look at it. Um, but in this case, I would say even a mountain division is useful with just about any 
stack of units you have as long as it's a mountain hex. Um, for instance, you could augment this infantry sitting there as an 8 and then add in the 3 times 1 of 3 and it's up to 11 and that's pretty good. Um, so and then, so I think you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck um, if you distribute your divisions with infantry if you have to. You know, you could put, uh, say you're trying to defend an entire mountain line, uh, which you know it would probably be tough to fight you there anyway, but if you had um, this infantry stacked with uh, the mountain division, and then beside it in the next hex, the mountain core. That's going to be a pretty tough line to uh, to fight through. Um, so yeah, these guys are pretty pretty good units, really. Um, but they are situational. I mean, otherwise, if you don't have them in a in a mountain hex, they're still a pretty good infantry unit. They're just a little bit more expensive than their normal infantry brothers. So it costs three to create a normal infantry. Uh, four to create a mountain uh, uh, core. Um, and just to show as a comparison for this cavalry unit, this cavalry happens to cost three. So it just takes a little bit longer to build. So there's certain things here, you know, when you're trying to decide in the production round what you're going to build, you know, the infantry are usually the cheapest and the fastest, but, um, you know, what you do with what you have it's all going to be situational in terms of what you're going to build, knowing that it's going to take two to three turns to get these guys out on the board. Um, that's it for the mountain units. Next are uh, these really interesting units with the T in the box. That is a T-E-R-R -R core, a territorial. Um, so the territorial units basically represent local fighting groups from a particular region or country area um, that are not as well trained as a typical uh, national core or division. Um, so here is the examples that I have. These are the German Pacific core territorial and the German Southwest Africa uh, territorial core. And you can see right away uh, that their movement um, kind of ranges, but their combat factors are pretty weak, at least these two, and, and I would say that across all the territorials available, they're, they're not going to be particularly powerful units, so they'll be relatively weak, um, kind of no matter what you do, and they are going to be attached to specific areas, so when this says Pacific, that truly means somewhere in the Pacific uh, that the Germans are going to place this unit, and where it's going to be expected to kind of reside for the most part. This being Southwest Africa. Um, there are uh, some other good examples out here. I'm bringing up the French one. So uh, the Algerian territorial. This one's actually not too bad. It's got a three combat power. Uh, so that's pretty good, actually. Um, and it's going to be based in and around Algeria. Um, so all the major powers, or some of the major powers with colonial holdings in the world, uh, British, French, German, they all have these territorial units. Um, the one thing that's unfortunate about them is that there will be a penalty to their combat role if a stack containing only territor territorials attack uh, a, a stack that contains non-territorial units. That basically reflecting their um, inferior training and doctrine and, and basic combat ability. And then the reverse for non-territorials attacking a stack of only territorials, uh, those non-territorial units will get a bonus. Um, they are never scrapped, so they'll always sort of be available in your force pool. Um, maybe the one good thing about them is that uh, they treat all terrain in their home country as clear for movement purposes. And so, you know, one good example of this, um, I'm going to scroll way out here for a second. Uh, the Ottoman Empire has some territorials for uh, these units in the Middle East here, and you can see uh, Syria uh, has the Sir Syria territorial unit. So it may treat all terrain in the home country as clear for movement purposes. So um, this has a, this unit has a pretty good movement speed already. It's got five, um, but these mountain hexes are going to be treated as clear if this unit goes through. So this unit could go one, two, 
than 3-4 um, very easily if it wanted to. Now, you know, you say, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It maybe still could have gotten here any other way. Um, but that can be useful if you're dealing with tough terrain. Um, and, and this represents the territorial units, you know, these national units of the area, you know, knowing all the right paths through the area. You know, this is their homeland. They know how to navigate it appropriately where uh, other units would maybe not have that capability. There is one special rule with territorials that are really interesting in that uh, if the territory that they belong in is a minor country territory, um, I should say territory, uh, not minor country. If they, if the territory um, is conquered by the opposing side, uh, they can potentially then have these territorial counters added to their force pool to be built. Um, so uh, that can be sort of a bummer if you say you know if you lost, let's say the Ottoman Empire lost Syria uh, to you know, we'll say the British. Uh, might be a likely uh, scenario if they lose Syria um, and it gets conquered by taking all the important areas of the of the territory um, the British might be able to go ahead and build this Syrian territorial unit on their side now there's not a really great way to denote that you can use vassal maybe to change a label and put some stuff in here if you're playing a, a physical game you probably want to try to use some sort of token or control counter that you that you've designated or something to show who controls that unit at the time um, so yeah the the real use of them maybe is as a local defense force for the territory um, until it gets conquered if you can't back it up or just an additive uh, unit to whatever you're you're working with. Um, you, you'll see these guys in Africa. You'll see them in uh, Asia. And again, um, you know their usefulness is going to be, you know, what you make of it, I guess. Um, next up are some really important units. These are engineering divisions. So there is no core equivalent. Um, these are just divisions. I'm showing two different uh, valued ones here for a reason I'll explain in a minute. The symbol being this, you know, almost like an E kicked over <laughs> uh, face planted. Uh, you know, E for engineer? I don't know. Um, I, I can't tell you the origin of the symbol and why it, why it is the way it is. Uh, but these guys are really important and they're very useful. Uh, what they do is, just right out of the gate, uh, if you're attacking with an engineer as part of the stack you get a plus one to your die roll if you're attacking an enemy who has an engineer uh, you're gonna have a minus one to your die roll and if you've got a stack with an engineer attacking a stack with an engineer then the plus one and the minus one kinda negate each other but obviously you know it's an extra little punch a plus one that that's pretty good that's like a whole another you know half shift of odds of force ratio so you like that um, a side benefit that they provide is that in the uh, same hex as, where, as there's an engineer division you can have an extra aircraft stack uh, stacking limit is increased by one I think I think it's one um, which I've never used it for this purpose I don't know how often people do but there's that I guess representing the engineers helping support a, an airstrip or an airport but then um, the, probably the most critical use of them, I think, especially in maybe the Western Front or really, I guess, anywhere um, where this is going to take real effect is uh, when attacking across a river or attacking across a fort hex side, they do not have their combat factors uh, halved. Ordinarily, that's that's what happens. So you, know, you look at uh, when you take any example. You know, say you're working your way through uh, Belgium, or you're working your way through uh, France, and you're trying to cross the Seine um, or the Rhine. Well, attacking across from here to here, or you know, here to here, you're going to cross that river 
um, you're going to take uh, your combat factors that are crossing that river hex side and you're going to divide by half. So, you know, two, four combat factor infantry, that's eight, divide in half, you're back down to four. Well, if you have an engineer unit in that hex with the other two units, the engineering division itself won't have its combat factors, and one unit for each combat factor that engineer division has also gets that benefit. So if this guy was stacked with two units and they crossed a, a river hex side, um, one of these two, and, and if they were different combat factors, you'd obviously pick the one with the greater number, would not be cut in half. So you'd have four plus the next core cut in half is two, so six. Then the engineer is seven, so that'd be seven combat factors. That's pretty good, especially you know if you're, you're working your way against these river and fortress hex sides, of which are going to be pretty critical tactical um, defenses in this game. That helps counter that um, and what you really want this is pretty good you really want the engineer divisions with two combat factors because what that allows you to do again the number of other units in the hex equal to the combat factor ignore the halving of their combat factors for crossing rivers in the fortress hex side so this one's the one you really want it's going to give that bonus to this whole stack so instead now the combat factors for this stack would be 10. 4 plus 4 plus 2, 10 across uh, a river or fort hex side. Um, that's going to be pretty strong. Uh, now, you, you don't have a huge number of these engineer units, so obviously you're going to want to leverage them uh, as best you can. If you know that the enemy, you know, if you're Germans and you're fighting France, and they've put some fortresses along this line here, uh, then obviously get some engineer divisions in place um, as part of those those big attacks. Um, that's going to be uh, very useful. The one danger to this is that if you're negating the river of the forts, um, these engineer units have to take the very first loss. So if you take a half loss or a one loss or whatever the case is, if you take a loss on the combat results table uh, and you use the engineer's ability to ignore having, uh, they have to go first. And these guys can be a little ex expensive, and they take a while to build. So if you lose them, um, that's going to hurt, and it's going to take some time to get them back on the board. Uh, you can opt to not u leverage their ability and just treat them like a, uh, an infantry division. right? You're just going to add two, and, and maybe it'll be cut in half to one because you're not using the engineers. And that basically represents, you know, you're not using the engineers to be the guys poking holes in the fortress walls or putting down the pontoon boats or, or you know, impromptu bridges to, to cross an enemy territory. They're, they're going to hang back and you can, you know, remove them for combat losses as you can. So keep that in mind. The, the usefulness is awesome. And in some places they're going to be really critical to your offensives, but uh, they will be in danger if you do so. Uh, next up are these garrison units. Um, they've got the little, you know, like it's sort of like an upside down ping pong paddle, um, or, or, um, you know, I, I'm not sure what this is meant to represent. I'm not a real expert in NATO symbols. A uh, couple of things, you know, the garrisons, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, have very low movement speed. Uh, they only have a movement of one. You're not going to be surging across the plains of Russia with these guys. Their combat ability is alright, three, I mean that, that's on the lower end, but that's moderate. Um, maybe the real nice thing is that they're cheap. They're cheaper than normal infantry, they only cost two to build, they take two turns to, to get on the board, and um, as you might expect with the name Garrison, they're going to be good for securing cities that may be open to partisan disruption and also for maybe guarding ports to help increase the defensiveness of important ports that you are afraid may get amphibious landings on. You just park one of these guys in there, and that's going to give you some good coverage while you know, your real units with greater movement speed and, and better combat factors are off in the main front, pushing the lines, making use of their, their movement speed. 
Um, I think in my solo game, I did take a Russian garrison and moved them up in the front line just to kind of help uh, beef up the line itself, but he'll be trailing behind everybody else forever, so it might have been a mistake for me to do that. Um, yeah, so that will be useful again, you know, if you can get uh, some territories that you're, you're afraid might get picked off from partisans, they're good for that. And then otherwise, maybe if you're invading Russia as Germany, um, or vice versa, and you want to put some guys into enemy-occupied cities so you don't have partisans pop up and cause all sorts of supply issues, you know, build these guys, rail them out to the city, plop them down, and let them hold it for you. Um, pretty straightforward stuff, nothing, anything, nothing, nothing special for them besides that. Uh, then next are the militia units, which have these nice big red M's in the middle of them. I think they're all red on, on all the militia units, uh, but at least for these German ones they are. A couple of special things to keep in mind about these guys. They look like they're, they're normal infantry. They've got movement speed that's in the normal range. They've got combat factors in the normal range. Uh, but they do have names of cities on the counter, on the front side of the counter, and that's important. That is where these counters must be placed. So when they're built or when they come on the board, they have to be placed uh, in that city. If the city is ever lost, so for instance, you know, Munich, if say the Italians cross the Alps and they take Munich, if this unit was in the force pool unbuilt or was in the production circle being built, uh, it will be removed. Basically, you know, if the city gets taken before the city's militia can be raised, you can't raise the militia. Kind of straightforward. If you take back the city, then you get the counter back in your force pool to build. You can then get it going. Um, typically, uh, these militia units are part of reserves. I don't think these two are. They'll have the RES stamp on them, which means they're part of the reserve pool, which means they may come on at your leisure once war has started. Um, these guys may end up going back to the reserve pool when at peace, so keep that in mind. Um, other than that, uh, you know, use them before you lose them, I guess. If you think Hamburg or Munich or, or any other place that has militia um, are going to be on the front lines and are in danger of being uh, overrun, try to pop them out and get them out to help fill the line in and defend the city. And, I mean, once you got them out, you know, hey, they can be part of your, your forward position if you're going to push back. Um, they're going to act like other units, so you're good to go. Um, and again, if you've built Munich, and for whatever reason they're not around Munich, and Munich is taken, they don't disappear because you've already raised them. Um, it's just that, you know, if you can't, if it's, if it's not on the board, uh, you lose that opportunity if you lose the city. So just keep that in mind. Um, take a look at your force pool, and if you've got militia... Uh, and you've got lines collapsing, you know, that might be a good idea to get them out. Uh, next up are the Marine Corps units. Now, um, I don't think there are any Marine divisions in this game. I tried looking through the counter pool and I didn't see them. Um, maybe I missed something or, or they're missing from the Vassal module. Uh, but I think they come in just core varieties. I think they all have this green... Uh, color to their NATO symbol box, and if you're colorblind, um, that might not be useful to you, but they do have the anchor symbol on them, so that, that's going to sort of be an obvious indicator that they're Marines. Um, now, these aren't World War II Marines. They, uh, you know, they're not as maybe nuanced as that, but they are still Marine units, which means they're good at amphibious types of warfare. Um, now, one warning right out of the gate is that these units are rare. They're limited in number, maybe one or two per country. Two, if you're um, a power maybe like the United States, I think, has two. Uh, but a country like Germany, I think, only has one. And they're also quite expensive. They're five build points. It's almost twice as expensive as a normal infantry. Uh, it takes three turns to build. They're typically... Um, pretty strong four or five combat factors. I think they may even go higher for some countries. Uh, three movement speed. And what makes them really valuable 
is kind of like how the mountain units could do things that normal units couldn't do in terms of mountains, though that may be reduced power. Uh, marine units, MAR units, can do things um, that normal units can't do, and they can do that maybe at half power, and they can do some things that normal units would have their combat factors halved for, they're unaffected. Um, so, for instance, a, a marine div, uh, marine corps may embark from you know embark onto a transport ship from a non-port coastal hex. So, just say as an example, um, you know the middle of the Spanish coast here at uh, hex twenty three twenty four. If you had uh, this unit here, you wouldn't need to be in a fort for this unit to hop onto a uh, transport ship that was in the Bay of Biscay. They could sort of get on there uh, without being at port. That isn't maybe too terribly useful, though I could maybe uh, imagine some scenarios where that would be good. Um, what they can also do is they can move across an all-sea hex side or an unfrozen lake at the cost of one extra movement point, though they can't take, uh, they can't trace supply Across that, say so, so. Where are some good examples of that? There's going to be um, an example like here. They may move across an all sea hex side. Well, this is an all sea hex side. There you go. Um, there's some other examples of that up here I could show, like Belfast, England. You know, you might not be doing that, but there's some other cases on the map of these sort of real close together areas um, that you could uh, cross, like even here. You're going to cross this all sea hex side to get over here, so instead of going, you know, one, two, three, you just go one, two. Um, may not always be incredibly useful, but that just denotes the Marine's ability uh, to cross body small bodies of water uh, without extra assistance because whatever small pontoon boats they may be using, or whatever the case might be, is, is factored into to the counter. Um, they may also debark from ships without being placed face down, even in an iced port. Um, and this includes naval invasions. So um, usually a normal infantry unit, if it was invading via naval warfare or amphibious, assault, amphibious invasion, sorry, um, they're going to flip when they're done with the attack if they survived and were successful and even being transported from place to place may pot may potentially flip them uh, marines don't have that problem they're 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 good at being sailed across the ocean or the lake <laughs> um, they ignore having their combat factors when amphibiously invading and attacking across straits so um, it's much like you know attacking across a river or, or attacking a fort, you know, most units are going to have their combat factors halved. If you do a naval invasion with normal infantry, uh, their combat factors will be halved, so a four becomes a two, and so on. Uh, Marines don't have that. They don't take that penalty. So this Royal Marine unit from the Commonwealth, if they invade a, a navally invade a, a hex, they're going to get their full five combat factors um, and that's pretty important because when you do these naval invasions, and I don't want to get too deep into the, the mechanics of that, um, it's tough because even if it's an empty hex, there's something called a notional unit. That means there's some defenses in the port, and that's going to be combat factors for the enemy, um, and you're still rolling on the combat chart, so... You know, every little bit of combat factor is going to be important so that you don't roll garbage and lose your units to being destroyed. And, of course, you know, marine units are expensive as it is, so you don't want to lose them. So if you're performing a good amphibious assault on some critical location, you're going to have, you know, naval ships doing shore bombardment, so lending aid for combat factors. Uh, you're going to use uh, marines so that you get the most combat factors possible in the attack. And, you know, that is going to do better than uh, if you hadn't done all those good things, right? Naval invasions are tough in this game, um, and they are risks. Uh, and you can kind of imagine, like, uh, the Gallipoli campaign 
Um, you can throw a lot of resources at that, uh, and, and it's nice because you can put units and forces um, in a number of possible areas using naval power, but there are some risks to it and some lost production that are going to be coming your way if you lose them. So keep that in mind, especially the British Marines because of their extra morale loss uh, rules. Um, you, you'll want to keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. But, but important, uh, important using uh, units if you're doing, uh, if you've got naval um, activities on the mind, uh, they will be important. Uh, now we're going to start getting into sort of the later war, um, we'll say technologically advanced units, uh, where things get a little bit um, more interesting in terms of what you're capable of doing. So the first up are the motorized core and division. They do come in both varieties, core and division. And you can tell that they're motorized by uh, the little wheels. <laughs> I like to think of them as on the bottom of the NATO symbol. Um, that motorized meaning, you know, these are infantry that are making use of uh, early cars and, and different things to transport units to the battlefield uh, and to, to move across the terrain. Uh, these are mobile units, so like cavalry, they can advance after combat without flipping. They're typically pretty strong, like this example, Motorized Corps, has a combat factor of 6. And uh, you can see they've got pretty good movement, 4 and 5, pretty close to being a cavalry. In some ways, these units um, could almost replace cavalry in the game. Um, now, you'll probably still make use of cavalry in, in the war, but these units can... Um, go where a cavalry might have gone and be just as effective. Um, because of that, I do recommend that the division, the motorized division, be kept with other mobile corps, whether that's a cavalry corps or a motorized corps like itself, so you can get the most use out of your advance after combat without flipping. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, if the combat table is blitz instead of assault, um, you have to take the first loss as either a motorized unit, a mechanized unit, or an armored unit. Um, so, you know, it, it be careful of that. Sort of mean, you know, they're, the, they're at the front lines pushing through. They're going to take losses first, I guess, is how you might think of it. So keep that in mind. And then the other thing is, this is, I think, the first unit that uses motorized movement, which means they use a different... Co movement cost uh, value on the terrain chart, which is on the world map. Um, so obviously you can think about this as sort of common sense. Um, places like forest hexes and swamp hexes will be more difficult for units that are motorized because uh, you can't just drive a jeep through a swamp very easily without getting stuck. So keep that in mind. If you're If you're in that rough terrain, maybe you're in you know, northeastern Russia, and there's a lot of swampland, motorized corps are not going to be your friend. You might want to rely more on cavalry uh, who still use leg movement terrain speed. Um, but overall, once you get a chance to use these guys, they're going to be pretty useful. They're not incredibly more expensive than a normal unit, so, um, you know, I, I'd say as, as they become available later in the war, uh, give them a go. Get them on the field if you can especially if you're looking at um, wide plain areas like in Ukraine. You know, these guys might be really useful. Um, and you'll also want to be using these motorized corps um, you know, as a mobile unit with some of the other divisions that we're going to be talking about in just a minute. So these, this might form the base of a new hex formation um, of mobile units that you'll want to make uh, the most use out of that for. Um, and just conveniently enough, we're going to get right into one of those types of units. So uh, next are these mechanized divisions. They come in division-only variety. Do not mistake these for the mechanized infantry of World War II. That is not what these units represent. Um, though they have the infantry with the sort of the track oval that is used for armored units overlaid with the infantry. This is the standard mechanized infantry NATO symbol. Um, these are not mechanized in the same way World War II is. These units, as used by Fatal Alliance as the Great War, uh, represent um, the shock and special forces units of the various powers. So for German 
Germany and Austro, uh, or Austria-Hungary. Uh, these are the Stoßtruppen, the stormtroopers who are known for you know running into the enemy uh, uh, lines and their trenches with uh, light machine guns to disrupt the enemy's line. Um, so these are that those units. Uh, the Italian Arditi. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Arditi, who were their special forces uh, units, and the Russians have their shock units. Um, and I think those these are the only ones. Uh, like I said, there's Austria-Hungary variation of these. But besides that, um, those are the only four powers in the game that get these. Um, you might say, hey, that's unfair. Uh, but it'll balance out in a second uh, when I talk about the next unit type, which you can probably guess at. Uh, but a couple of things to, to note about this. As opposed to other games where a mechanized infantry might... You might think it uses motorized movement, but in this game it does not. Again, because these are meant to be shock troopers and storm troopers, they do use leg movement. Um, they may advance without flipping, and so I do recommend maybe you, you set these guys up uh, in hexes with cavalry corps, so you can make use of the leg movement, advance after combat. Or, you know, you can include them with a motorized infantry, and as long as you're not getting gummed up by swamps, uh, you can get the benefit of the advance after combat with these guys. Um, now, they're not terribly expensive. Uh, they're, they're maybe a little expensive for a division. Um, and what they're really useful for is, they if you are attacking with these units included in the attacking hexes, uh, they provide the attacker the choice of the combat table, if the terrain allows for it, and you got to check the terrain chart for that, and the attacker has more mechanized units than the defender, and the defender doesn't have any armor or anti-tank there. So um, it's sort of weird if logic there uh, to follow where this is really useful, but again, assuming the enemy doesn't have armor or anti-tank, so no heavy, heavy stuff, and they have less mechanized units than you do, which in many cases is going to be zero, since not many units get these, or not many countries get these units, uh, the attacker is going to get the, the choice of the combat table. Um, and if you look at the combat table, obviously, you know, assault is going to be dealing more deaths to each side, whereas the blitz combat table uh, is going to allow for less losses for the attacker and more chances to force the enemy to retreat. So trying to bust hole through lines and make advances uh, on the front. Um, just know that if the combat table is blitz, you're going to have to take one of these guys as the first loss as the attacker, or an armor unit, or a motorized unit if they're available. It's going to be one of those three. Um, so you know this might be sort of like the engineers, a case where you might lose them if you use them, but um, sometimes that. Uh, combat table choice is going to be real critical in how the combat turns out. One other thing is if the combat is a blitz and you're attacking a clear or desert desert hex in fine weather, uh, you're going to get a plus one modifier to your die roll per mech unit and per armor unit. So if you have sort of a combined uh, attack going on, um, this is where you get an opportunity for a lot of uh, bonuses to your die roll. So um, that's kind of ideally how you're going to want to use them, maybe on the Western Front, for instance, where uh, there's a lot of clear hexes here to push through to Paris. Uh, your your stormtrooper units are going to be a big help with that. So um, pretty good. And, and they'll start to come in later in the war. Uh, this one comes in 1915, so that's not too bad. 1917, 1918, 1916. So you don't, you won't have them at the very beginning of the game, uh, but they'll be useful once they start to show up. Um, now, finally comes World War One tanks. Yes, but they only come in division variety. Uh, they are not, you know, um, mass uh, mechanized armies like the Germans used in World War Two. Uh, these, this is the very early form of tank warfare. Um, and so they're only going to be in divisions. They're not going to add very many combat factors. You can see all these ones here are one combat factor. I've included, I think these are all the countries that get tanks, period. Um, 
And even then, the Germans don't really have many of these counters at all, while the Commonwealth and the Americans, I think, have um, a number of them. Not a huge number, but more than the Germans do. Um, these units can advance without flipping, so they're a mobile unit, and thus they're going to be good to be stacked with Cavalry Corps or Motorized Corps. Um, you know, I imagine Motorized Corps with Armored Divisions is probably going to be a good combination to use. Um, they do use the motorized movement car, uh, cost, so you're not going to be trying to run these tanks through a swamp. I mean, heck, even in the terrain of the Western Front, tanks had a hard time getting through all the trenches, and they broke down a lot, so that, you know, they were kind of an issue. Um, they're, again, they're not, there's not many of them, and they're pretty expensive. For a division, you're paying four, which is more than an entire infantry corps in cost. So these things are expensive. They really are. Um, and it's going to be a matter of, will the cost... Um, you know, are, will the benefits outweigh the cost? Uh, they will, if attacking uh, a defender with anti-tank units, which those are in the game, um, the anti-tanks combat factors will double. So, you know, don't go attacking a hex with anti-tank units, obviously, with your armored divisions. Um, they, like the mechanized units, will provide the attacker choice of the combat table, assuming the terrain allows for it. And in this if logic is a little bit better than mechanized, the attacker has more armor than the defender, though defending anti-tank units would count as two armor divisions for that purpose. So basically, um, you know, if you compare the if logic between mechanized and armor divisions, armor divisions are more likely to give you that choice of combat table, especially, again, considering that the allies are going to have greater access to armor divisions than the Central Powers will. Um, there's a good chance that the allies are going to get to make use of that um, combat table choice uh, when these guys come around. Um, again, if the combat table is blitz, then these guys may end up taking the first loss um, or a mechanized or a motorized unit. And uh, like the mechanized unit, again, if the combat is blitz and you're attacking a clear desert hex in fine weather, you'll get a plus one per uh, armor division or mech division. So again, good opportunities to get some nice uh, straight up bonuses to your die roll uh, for combat, which can be really important. And um, still with the anti-tank thing, which we'll talk to in a little bit uh, further below. Uh, you will get a negative modifier to your attack die roll if you're attacking uh, anti-tank units. So, you know, it seems like a no-brainer. Don't attack places with anti-tank units, but you might end up being forced to if, you know, that's the only option you really have and the central powers have just, you know, dared you to do it. Um, kind of tough to say. Um, now we get into kind of the more odd units of the game. Um, of course, it wouldn't be World War One without gas attacks. So there are gas divisions, and you get them. I think the first gas divisions become available for building in 1915. So they do come in fairly early in the in the overall game. The way they work is when you're attacking with a gas unit in the attacking formation or set of hexes, uh, you will roll a separate die, and that die roll will dictate how effective the use of gas was. There's a chance that it may have no effect on your overall combat die roll. It may actually give you a penalty to your die roll because the gas blew back in your face, essentially. Or you're going to get a bonus to your die roll somewhere between 1 and 3. There's a 50% chance of getting a bonus of that 1 through 3, a 20% chance of getting the minus 1. Um, and then a 30% chance of getting no effect. So it is a bit of a gamble, right? I mean, you might get that minus one, but if you can pull off the plus three, I mean, plus three is a very significant bonus to a die roll. So um, that can be a pretty big, big deal. The only con to that is every time you do that, each gas attack causes a U.S. entry die roll. Um, and you got to look at the chart to, to see that. But basically... If the central powers perform a gas attack, then it's going to potentially increase the timeline for the U.S. entering the war on the side of the Allies. If the Allied powers use gas attacks, there's going to be that chance that it delays the United States' entry into the war. And maybe I can imagine some scenarios where 
if the Allies go buck wild with the gas attacks, the United States maybe never enters the war. I don't know. I don't. Based on the numbers, I don't think that would happen. But it's going to depend on how much you're using gas attacks. Um, uh, when you do the gas attack, it will cause the divisions to flip because you're using up their, I guess their, their gas ability. Um, otherwise, if you're not using their gas ability, they're they're basically just going to be a nice weak infantry division, which can still be useful. Um, I can understand some situations where if you're the central powers, you're going to really want to leverage your gas units to try to get that plus three bonus to get through some really critical attacks, maybe on the western front, and try to get into Paris and, and really hurt France before the United States has a chance to even enter the war. You might say, hey, yeah, I'm increasing the chances the U.S. is going to come in, but... Um, I like the idea of having really successful attacks, and if I can knock France out of the war, who cares if the United States comes in early? Maybe you decide to take that gamble. Um, and again, it's maybe going to be a, a, you know, a gradient of how much you use it versus not use it. But it's an interesting um, strategic choice in the game. I like that they included it. Uh, the the symbols are, are badass with the, the gas mask here and, and all that, so... Um, very cool addition to the game. Glad they're here, and they definitely have a good use uh, in the game. Um, next, uh, I almost didn't qualify these as units, but in the way they're used, they are kind of units. Uh, these are fort hex sides. Uh, you do build them. They have a build cost. They have a build time. And you know when you build them and when you place them, you sort of orient it in such a way uh, that, and you can do this in Vassal by rotating the counter, uh, what hex side is defended by the fort. So if I had it like so, um, the fort is here, essentially, and if someone's attacking from this hex into this hex, they will be impacted uh, by the fort. I talked a little bit about forts earlier with the engineers. Usually uh, units attacking a fort across that defended hex side are going to divide their combat factors in half. Um, so you're probably going to want to... Uh, place these at really critical points in your lines um, on important borders. Uh, you can kind of imagine and you know, imagine like places like Verdun or the hex that basically represents Verdun, uh, which would be around here. Uh, you're going to want to put forts there to help defend those critical areas. Um, they also do provide the defender with the combat table choice if the attack is only coming through fort hex fort sides. So um, there's that. Um, but these forts can be flipped by ground strikes like other units. So artillery, which I'll talk about in a minute, and planes can do bombardment, which can cause units to flip and become disrupted, thus providing bonuses to an attacker attacking them. Uh, the benefits of a fort, you know, if you cause a fort unit to flip, um, then it's like the fort's not there at all. Um, and even if you buy multiple of these counters and you make it so that, say, five hex sides of a six-sided hex, right, hex, hex has six sides, there, even if you're, even if you got a fort on each of these, if a ground strike is successful for the fort, um, they're all gone. So you don't have, you know, if you had this counter and this counter in this hex, it's all treated as one fort. And again, if, if that enemy artillery strike is successful, the ground strike is successful, these guys are flipped, and the fort now is nullified. Um, so, you know, in general, uh, they're going to be useful for defense. They are a little expensive in terms of what you're getting and then how long they take to build. So you may not be building a whole lot of these things, and the fact that they can be countered by artillery and engineers. Um, you know, it's just a matter of, is your opponent going to bring the right tools to the job? And if they do, um, you know, these things might not be very useful, but uh, you'll have to figure that out in your game that you're playing, whether or not it's valuable to put these guys up. It at least gives uh, the enemy something to worry about uh, at the very least. Uh, next up is artillery. Um, artillery comes in two varieties in this game, technically three. Uh, but the main type is 
These guys here, these two counters, are field artillery. They're just denoted by uh, their unit symbol with a, with a dot in the middle. I guess that's supposed to be sort of like a cannon if you're looking at it from the front. Um, so our field artillery are slow moving. You can see uh, they, they'll typically have a movement speed of one. Uh, but they are critical for major offensives. They can either be used uh, as part of a stack um, utilizing their combat factors, just part of your combat factors, so that can be pretty good. Um, this is a standard one, a 3-1, and then here's Big Bertha. You know, you can go look that up on Wikipedia if you don't know what that is. A really big um, uh, howitzer gun the Germans used to just flatten fortifications. Uh, really big gun. You know, it has power of five, which is which is good. Um, some things to keep in mind: they may not advance after combat. So even if you you know say move a whole stack of units up after advancing, they're not going to follow, and they're going to be bringing up the rear and moving so slow. You can kind of imagine, you know, if your whole front's moving pretty quickly, you may end up with these guys lagging way behind. Also, uh, if they're attacked by themselves and they're not stacked with any other units, they've got a combat factor of one. So they can be very vulnerable, but I can't imagine a scenario where um, you'd be leaving them alone like that. Uh, they can do the ground strikes, which, um, again, is, is something that uh, airplanes can also do. And how that works is uh, you're going to target a hex, and for each unit, there, you're going to roll a die. If it's their combat factor or less on the die roll, then it's going to flip the unit, and that is done uh, before movement and before normal combat. So it's something you do in preparation for an offensive. Um, that can be kind of useful, right? Is it more valuable to have a 5 to your combat factor for an odds ratio or the plus 2 for a flipped core, a disrupted core of the enemy? Um, you know, but you got to roll for it, so it's going to be a little bit of a gamble every time you do this. Uh, ground support is going to be uh, something that you can do either on the attack or the defense for adjacent hexes. Um, works in a similar manner. Um, they can't provide these. Uh, they can't provide ground support uh, if their own hex is being attacked. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, you know, if you're curious about ground strikes and ground support, you'll want to look that up in the rules. I might be able to do a demonstration video on how all that works. Um, do know that if you do do a ground strike or a ground support, that will flip uh, the unit. It will flip the artillery so that, uh, you know, you just can't do it over and over and over again. They've got to become unflipped via reorganization and, and different things. Um, there are different costs. So this is, you know, this is a three cost artillery normal and then Big Bertha cost more obviously it's a more uh, powerful uh, unit um, do know that ground strikes and ground supports are limited by weather and terrain uh, so forests and swamps are going to have these combat factors for the purposes of those die rolls um, rain and snow will do the same thing and then when there's a storm blizzard or while you're surprised in a surprise round or a surprised impulse uh, you can't do any ground striking or ground support uh, at all. So I, I would you get a fair number of these guys, and so I would say you know as as they should be, they're important. Artillery is important to World War One warfare. You will want to make good use of them. You will want to have them on your front lines. You will be using them to to make uh, you know as part of major offensives. Um, you know you, you they're going to be a big part of the game. So keep that in mind. Keep them moving forward. Keep them flipped uh, up. Keep trying to get them organized so they can keep moving. Um, big part of the game. Uh, the next set here, these are uh, anti-tank artillery. I'm pretty sure the only country that gets these are um, uh, Germany. Germany's the only one who gets these guys. Um, they come in two varieties, as you can see here. There's one that's motorized and one that's not. Um, it's going to depend if they're motorized. They use motorized movement. If they're not, uh, I think they use. I think they're considered to use leg movement. Um, they're pretty much going to be best used against allied armor divisions. 
So, you know, I talked about the armor divisions already. Um, you know, if you see the allies are going to be putting their armor divisions out, you're going to want to get your anti-tank divisions out to counter them. Um, they have a combat factor of one if attacked alone, like field artillery, uh, but they do have their combat factors doubled if they're attacked by armor divisions or mechanized divisions. And I'm not sure if the mechanized division thing is a holdover from the World War II mechanics of World in Flames, uh, but that is included in the rules, so keep that in mind, easy to miss. Uh, and they do count as two armor divisions for all that logic related to land combat table selection. Um, so they are basically going to be the help be used to nullify blitzes um, and, and work to take out uh, those armored divisions. Um, there's not too many of these guys, so just keep that in mind. Uh, you get them later in the game. They're not terribly expensive, so I'd say you know build them if your opponent is going for their mechan their their mechanized or armored uh, units in the production circle. Um, this particular artillery unit here, the KW Geschutz, aka the Paris gun, I remember, recommend looking that up if you're unfamiliar with it. This was a big uh, rail artillery gun that they were using to try to hit Paris from um, a really long distance away. I don't, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, incredibly extended range. I think they ended up dismantling it because uh, the Allies were going to potentially overrun it or something, and so they destroyed it. But we don't have a huge amount of real-life specs on it. Um, and oddly, the Rules as Written rulebook provides no rules for using this counter. Um, I, I suppose it, it's just going to be treated as a normal artillery unit until otherwise. Um, I suppose you could come up with some house rules to give it you know, an extra hex of range, and it can only travel along rail routes. I think that might be an interesting um, way to house rule it. But if you did that, again, that'd be a house rule. Um, I've inquired with the game designer if there are special rules intended for this counter that missed publication. I haven't received a response yet, but if I do, I'll, I'll try to communicate that out somehow. Um, and finally, and I know this, this video is going on long, and I apologize for that. I wanted it to be much quicker, but I wanted to make sure I explained uh, the uses of all these counters. Last, and, and potentially the most important unit of the game, these are HQs, and they're going to have the names of generals you might have heard of. Uh, you know, Ludendorff, Pershing, Brusilov. Um, and what these guys represent are the sort of aggregate um, military command staff plus uh, it sort of has a built-in core unit with it because it has a decent combat factor. The, the numbers on here are a little bit different than your standard counter. They have combat factors, which is the first number, and, and they tend to be you know about what you would expect from a normal infantry core. Uh, they also have uh, this number in parentheses, which is considered their... Uh, organization value, reorganization value. Uh, and then the third number is movement. So it's, you know, a combat factor and movement is still on here. They just added an extra number in the middle. So, and I'll explain what's that, what that is used for uh, in just a second. Uh, these HQ units can act as a secondary supply source and as a rail station. Um, that's all tied up in the supply rules. I won't re reiterate here, but these are going to be really critical for making sure that your guys, uh, your units are not out of supply, um, especially during winter turns with bad weather uh, and you're far from friendly home cities. Very important. You'll definitely want to make sure you have enough of these guys in a major front that all your units are getting proper supply. Um, they may embark from a non coastal hex, sort of like a marine unit, um, and units stacked with them can also do the same thing. They can embark from a non-port uh, coastal hex. Uh, they can provide half of the reorg value of the HQ to a combat die roll if attacking or defending using what's called HQ support. Um, doing that turns the HQ unit face down after any advancing after combat step, but the basic idea there is you know, you flip the HQ, or you plan on flipping the HQ, uh, they're going to get to add uh, uh, their reorg value 
um, half the reorg value, and I think that might be rounded down in some cases. Now, if you're in a combat, you know, with an HQ versus an HQ, and you both want to do HQ support, then you're going to find the difference between the two, then half that, and the one, you know, who survives the subtraction is going to get that bonus. So in some cases, you're not going to get much of any bonus for doing that. In other cases, you might get quite a bit if you're doing it unopposed. Uh, they can also make use of offensive points to double the combat factor of nearby units um, and uh, or provide extra dice for artillery when they're doing ground strikes. That's really uh, a really important part of this game. I'm not going to get too deep into it here about how offensive points work, but basically you stockpile them, which is like stockpiling ammunition and, and supplies, and then in major offensives, that's basically what they represent. You're going to spend those points, um, uh, which is going to be based on the reorg value of the HQ you're using to do it, because it's really the HQ unit that spends those offensive points. And uh, a number of units nearby are going to become twice as strong. And that's really important in this game. That's going to be really important to major offensives that you've probably read about. If you've read about World War I, the Brusilov Offensive, the Spring Offensive, all these things. That's essentially what's happening. You're burning through these resources. You're beefing up your units with extra power, and you're attacking in bulk. Um, uh, if they're attacked by themselves, um, or, or they're involved in combat by themselves, and you suffer a .5 loss, they can ignore the .5 loss. Not sure how often that'll come up, but it's useful. Uh, they can also flip to reorganize nearby units. Um, nearby meaning their reorg value in hexes, so for like Batane, that's three hexes away. A unit can become reorganized, which basically means to flip it back. Uh, if it was face down for any number of reasons, you can turn it face back up. Um, and you're going to do that for the number of units equal to this reorg value. So, you know, within three hexes, three units would get to flip back right side up in exchange for this unit flipping. Um, and that's going to be important because uh, you can use that to keep your offensives going. You know, if you did a, some big offensive, you spent a bunch of offensive points, um, and then before it gets to the end of your impulse, then you flip this guy, all those units that may have, you know, done really well in combat and they all advanced and flipped well now they become unflipped and they can potentially get a whole other round of attacking on another impulse um, or better secure the areas that they've taken in their offensive so that's going to be really important um, then uh, once they've become face down once an HQ is face down they can only become face up again during the final reorg at the end of a turn or via spending more offensive points to uh, flip HQs face up. And there is a cost associated with that. And honestly, you're always running low on offensive points, so I'm not sure how often you'll be doing that a lot. Uh, but again, the basic idea is you use these guys to beef up your units, um, wreak some havoc, advance after combat, flip to unflip them. Maybe then you spend more off offensive points to unflip the HQ unit, and if you somehow have some magical wealth of offensive points, maybe you do a whole other huge offensive. Uh, but again, in my game experience, offensive points are um, uh, they're hard to keep <laughs> lumped together because you're always you know, trying to build units, so you've got to spend some production to get the offensive points, and then you're spending them, and you're always running low, and it's expensive to do anything with them. So uh, you won't be doing it a lot, but that's how they'll be used. And that's it. I, I've covered all the land units in the game. Um, I will eventually cover sea units and air units. Uh, but boy, you know, it, already it's been well over an hour, an hour and 15 minutes I've been recording this video. Um, if you've sat through this whole thing, good job. <laughs> uh, hopefully you've learned something here and just how how to utilize these units, what all they really mean, how would you use them. Um, as a as a summary, or or at least a, a guidance. Um, I shouldn't say summary. This definitely is not a summary. It took so long to record. Uh, I think what I'm going to try to do is put together a little document that summarizes everything I talked about here today, uh, and put that on Board Game Geek. I'll probably wait until I've been able to put something together for all the units in the game, 
including the sea and air units. Um, but that would be useful for some folks, I think, uh, since, you know, these special roles for, like, marine units and engineers and mountain units, they're not all located in one place in the rulebook. They're sort of scattered around, so creating a breakdown summary uh, can definitely help in getting people familiar with uh, the game mechanics. So that's all I had for today. Um, if you like this video, uh, I guess hit the like button. I don't know what that's really going to do for me, but go ahead and do that or give me a thumbs up on Board Game Geek. Um, I appreciate discussion, so let me know what you think of the video either in Board Game Geek comments or YouTube comments, and uh, I'll look to figure out what uh, will be next on my to-do list for videos. Again, um, C and Air units are probably going to be coming next, so all good stuff. Uh, thank you for watching, and we'll catch you another day. Thank you.